Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 62, The Unicorn Vlog. <laughs> there are many mythical creatures in our lands. Dragons, wizards. I've always wanted to be a wizard, love the beard, love the hat. But there is a mythical creature that has some resonance in doctoral education. We call them the unicorns, the students that finish in under three years. Here are two unicorns that I prepared earlier. Sunny Rushavara finished her PhD in two years, nine months we're saying Sunny. We are and that's generous. That two, we are. two years, <laughs> nine months and Amy Seymour Walsh who finished her PhD in three years two months. How did they do that? We're about to speak to these two remarkable, wonderful women who are, yes, unicorns, special, magical and mythic. Hi. Hi. <laughs> now, before we start, tell me about your thesis. So Amy, tell people what your thesis was on. Uh, so I began as a master's research student uh, comparing two different skill teaching methods uh, which paramedics and other health professionals can learn uh, resource skills. Uh, so I was initially just comparing two of the skill teaching methods and it then grew to examine assessment methods and validation of assessment methods um, and more into a qualitative review. So it grew so big that it became a PhD. That is fantastic and again a very unusual story and quite inspirational. So that's brilliant. It started as a master's, a timely master's and then became a timely PhD. Sunny, what's your thesis on? My thesis is on the mediated, mediated representations of Africans in Australia as opposed to their lived realities and just exploring the misconceptions that are often pre presented in the media as opposed to how these people live their day-to-day -day lives. However, this thesis did not start off like this. Um, I initially studied my PhD in climate change. Um, <laughs> that's a long story and a story for another day, but yes. <laughs> so it started on one topic, so you actually changed topics as yes. well. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's remarkable. So again, not, not everything has gone well for the unicorns on the way through, but therefore I'm going to ask you, and I'll start with Amy, what were the challenges that you confronted through the doctoral process? Were there any challenges? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I think one of the key challenges was the sheer volume of work mm. um, and aside from that the type of work uh, because I entered the research with a very quantitative mindset thinking that the knowledge would be clear and fairly undisputed because it's represented in numbers I ended up with a very qualitative approach and that was as a result of the personal journey that I had gone through as a researcher. Um, and there was a lot of beauty that came from that, but it was really difficult because at every step along the way I had to challenge my assumptions about the world and reality um, and be willing to embrace new, a new understanding. Um, so that was incredibly difficult mental and emotional work. I think you have to be quite vulnerable, or I had to be quite vulnerable with myself in order to get to the end point. That's remarkable. I think you've also captured there, that's also the journey of paramedicine in mm. some ways, qual, quant subjective, objective, managing the crisis, managing mm. the difficulty, but having long-lasting outcomes mm. as well. So your personal journey was also the profession's journey exactly. too. Mm. Astounding. Mm. Oh no. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> tell, me, tell me about the challenges, Sunny. The challenges, um, mostly is confidence, I would say confidence, confidence in myself. Um, that was my biggest challenge, believing that I was actually doing a PhD. Well, I mean, it's a big jump from doing an honours or a master's to doing, you know, something that hasn't been done before. And I think that's mm -hmm. what I struggled with earlier on is, is this really unique? I kept thinking one day I'll wake up and someone would have done my PhD. Wow. <laughs> and that was my biggest fear. So just being confident in what I was presenting was 
good and was at a high standard is what I wrestled with the most. And I think that's really powerful because I think we don't talk about confidence enough. We think, right, we're doing scholarship, it's fine, you're enrolled, you have milestones. Mm -hmm. Actually, fronting up every day and talking to supervisors and managing mm -hmm. processes, mm -hmm. you know, that requires a lot of guts and I think yes. a lot of courage. Yes, definitely it does. Um, you need a good, strong support system mm -hmm. to help you with that, whether it be family, colleagues or indeed your supervisors um, but it's not something that's organic to a lot of people or I, I, I don't know mm -hmm. some people um, having that confidence to say this is what I'm doing this is going to be groundbreaking and this is how I'm going to do it without disputing or your confidence uh, being swayed and, and losing your way I think that's mm -hmm. superb Next question, I've never asked either of you this, is about the surprises. Mm -hmm. In your head before you started the PhD, which was only a few years ago, <laughs> um, when you started the PhD, you might have had a notion of what it was. Mm -hmm. Did anything surprise you on the way through? Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So I thought that there must be a standard way that you move mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. a, a PhD or, or research higher degree, but nobody could tell me what it looked like, and so I grappled with it for pretty much the full three years before I realised that it's, it's individual to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, I thought that you run a study, you get results, and the results need to be significant and original, and then you get mm -hmm. your PhD. Whereas what I've learned is that a non-significant finding is mm -hmm. actually still really yes. important. Yes. Um, and when things go wrong, yeah, it's exactly. a great result. Mm -hmm. And so many of my studies were born through um, things that could be considered failures in my early mm -hmm. studies, but to, to reframe them as opportunities mm -hmm. for further research, yes. it forced me to extend my research beyond where it would have been contained to otherwise. So I'm actually really thankful for some of those That's um, powerful. big issues. Mm -hmm. And so great too, because I know Amy very well. She's a fabulous human being. And the idea that she wants a template is so <laughs> Amy. It's like, can you just give me, give me the template and I'll fill the template for you. But mm -hmm. the other great thing is you realise that research is iterative mm -hmm. and the iterations is what's given that thesis mm -hmm. propulsion and energy. So that's really, mm -hmm. that's really amazing. I love how you want a template. Like, just tell me, <laughs> give me a recipe. And I'll fill in the recipe. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> surprises. Surprises. I think mine is quite similar to Amy's actually. Because um, building on that confidence thing, when I first started my PhD, I went to the library and got every book on how to write a PhD. <laughs> and because I, it, I thought it was a structured thing, you know, you need, you know, an introduction, lit review, methods, results, but I hadn't realized that it's, it's, it's subject to change depending on what you're doing. And I was in cultural studies, the literature is vast. So I needed something that would tell me how to minimize the literature I had to read, but also give me peace of mind that I was doing enough. Yes. But I soon realized that this is not how a PhD works. Just because there's a how-to book does not mean you have to follow everything it said. Because um, you're just given snapshots of how to do things. It's not deep and it's not mm. specific to what your individual project is. Mm. Yeah. And now I understand why all those PhD books sell so well, particularly in the United States, because people are going, where's the template? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I just read enough how to write a PhD mm. books, mm. I'll, I'll find yeah. that mm. template. Yeah. <laughs> That's so you. Uh, mm. Right, now the next question, let's get crunchy. Mm. Let's get crunchy. What was the biggest barrier or the biggest challenge that you confronted? Oh gosh, the biggest challenge. Um, I think aside from the sheer volume of work, wow. um, the additional jobs that I worked in the meantime, I felt that it was a real, te almost tearing apart of my identity. So at university um, full time, I would be a, a research higher degree student. At my clinical work, I would be a paramedic. In my other work, I would be teaching clinical education to master students, and I love doing each of these, um, but they they were all quite distinct, um, wow. and in many ways they lent themselves to each other. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I found I found it quite difficult to adopt a particular mindset because other mindsets became such a part of me. And you know, when you're on the side of the road in a car accident, mm. you have to be a in paramedic. That moment, you yes. can't be thinking about a literature review. <laughs> um, <laughs> that doesn't mm. help. 
Uh, so I found that a real challenge um, and I, I tried to then figure out ways that I could um, s schedule my work to, to take most control over that uh, rather than flitting in and out mm. of all of them mm. continuously. I mean, mm. Amy, that's so powerful because I'm impossibly old and, and you're impossibly <laughs> young and I've forgotten that. I've forgotten when you're an early academic, early career academic, you're having to move between modes. Mm. And I suppose as we get old and more experienced, we learn to move mm. smoothly between those jobs and those roles. But I'd forgotten, you have to learn how to do that. Mm. And you learn how to do that mm. in a PhD. So that's a barrier, that's a challenge. Yeah. And it can feel quite clunky. Mm. And additionally then figuring out how to be a person, aside mm. from your professional self, um, you know, with family, nephews and nieces and siblings and parents and friends, it's how, that all takes a lot of emotional headspace. Mm. And I felt particularly towards the end that part of my emotional self was very challenged because I was so in thesis mode. Wow. Uh, so to try and figure out how to look after myself as a person, eating properly, um, staying relatively sleeping, fit, sleeping mm -hmm. all of those things um, become incredibly important and they can be sometimes overshadowed by the professional requirements. Very well said. We're going to talk about families directly because mm -hmm. I think families do matter in this. Mm -hmm. But here we go. Oh, I don't know what we're going to say here, Sally. Why? The biggest barrier. What? <laughs> biggest barrier or challenge that you confronted? Um, cool. Biggest challenge I faced was the isolation. I, I know mm. I might have said this before, but it's difficult being an international student in a new system that you haven't really learned in. So coming as a PhD student, you don't know how people progress from undergrad to masters to honours and just what's expected of you. So I, I challenged myself thinking the Australian system, is it more rigorous than the British? Am I supposed to work as the same British system that I had worked in? Um, as well as administrative things, there were differences in how things were processed, different milestones, different requirements of supervisors, and it was just finally getting a supervision team that was looking out for me in, in terms of the admin that I had to do um, sheltering me from things I didn't necessarily have to do and giving me the right direction as to what to do to just not wallow myself in that <laughs> research and not have a life outside mm -hmm. of it so I think it was just a combination of you know those things that I mm -hmm. wrestled with but I'm, I'm so glad you said that again I hadn't really thought that through I think we do assume when stu in international mm -hmm. students or any student arrives mm -hmm. that we all have that expectation about what a PhD mm -hmm. is and we assume Britain is just like Australia and it's just not mm -hmm. and and thinking about that now again never thought about this before Sunny mm -hmm. but of course you had it ended up your supervisory team was a British scholar who had worked in Australia and done the same journey yes. as you and an Australian scholar who'd worked 10 years in Britain and that combination meant that our assumptions and expectations yes. we all understood yes. where we were where at. we were coming from and what was expected um, in, in order to, to do the best we could. And I think that made it stronger. Again, I hadn't thought about that at all. That's a, that's a, but again, that, that notion, the assumption that we all think the same, mm -hmm. the supervisors and the students, that can hurt the students, I think. It, it, it can, especially if earlier on I had problems in communicating that. Um, and, you know, it, it, it only took, you know, yourself and our other supervisor um, to to sort of say, hey, that's that's not okay, or here's what, how we're going to do things from now onwards. Very powerful. And Sunny, I'll get you to continue mm -hmm. too, and again, Amy's already touched on this too, about balancing paid work mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the PhD. You were both in full-time study, yes. and you were both doing paid work. How did you balance that, the need to pay your bills, mm -hmm. uh, but also do the doctorate? That was, and still is, a big challenge for me. Um, being an international student, I was fee-paying, so work meant I could pay my fees. It wasn't sort of like, oh, it would be good to have extra pocket money. So, you know, balancing, you know, dedicating your days to studying, picking up as much work as I can in order to meet the financial requirements that are, you know, needed for you to be enrolled in a PhD. So 
And yeah. you did all sorts of work. I mean, you not only did the tutoring and the lecturing and so forth. Tell all us about sorts. the sort of jobs you did. Hospitality, um, cleaning, jobs that I didn't think, you know, I would be doing. Um, not saying demeaning them in yeah. any way, but I had a figure in mind and I had to raise it. So there was no way out of it. Um, and so that's that's the struggle with quite a number of international students, particularly those with families as well. It's not just your study that that's important, but you have to make sure you fulfill, you know, your financial obligations to the institution, to your, you know, dependents at home and things like that. So it, it, I'm still wrestling with it. I haven't found the perfect balance for me yet. Really, saying, so did you find that putting that work balance together, did it impact on the study at all? It did. Um, I always feel if I didn't have to work, my PhD could have been much better <laughs> than it is. Couldn't um, have been better. Couldn't have been better. But again, I'm extremely hard on myself, so that's that's yeah. a story for another day. Yeah. Um, but I feel, yeah, I, I, if I didn't have to worry about you know, paying that tuition fee, I would have dedicated more time to study. But the weird thing is, as your supervisor, is I'm not sure, well, the thesis couldn't have been any better. <laughs> And I'm not sure you could have done it any faster, Sonny. Oh my God. <laughs> well, you know, following in big footsteps. Oh, no, no. But I tell you what, no, you put a lot of pressure on yourself, and that's interesting in itself. Mm. Now, mm. with you, Amy, there's a lot going on in terms of paid work and incredibly pressurised, stressful, mm. somebody's life in your hand mm. paid work. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, well, I think for me, it's only at the start of my PhD... I didn't find it as big a deal. Um, but at that point, I was enrolling a master's and I had my head firmly in the sand and I thought, oh, you know, she'll be right, this will get done, things are moving forward. Yes. And my clinical shifts were 10 hours long, um, which was a you know reasonably long day, I thought, but it was achievable. Um, about halfway through, the clinical shifts changed to 12-hour day shifts and so I was returning up at 4.30 in the morning. Um, they would very rarely finish within 12 mm -hmm. hours. And so the additional fatigue um, that that created for me just wore down a few of my um, yeah. tolerances, I think. Um, even though I had to do slightly fewer shifts, it just made me, it took longer to recover from those shifts. Because you'd be exhausted. You'd yeah. be exhausted. Exhausted. I'd be hungry. You wouldn't, you know, get emails on time. And then when you did, it'd be, you'd often be too tired. So, so I'd get home and just go to bed because I was too tired. Even though, and when you're not nourishing yourself, it's hard to think. So for me, a big lesson I learned was I need to eat vegetables multiple times a week. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I can't think. Yes. And and that was like a you know the a revelation. Are laughing yes. at me? Yeah, it's like eat noticed. vegetables. Mm. I mean that that'll be the subtitle yeah. for this vlog. Just eat vegetables. It'll be fine. Yeah. And so a lot of those things, the extra impact that work had um, brought some mm. of them to light. But also because that happened towards the end of the PhD when you're tired uh, like I felt like I'd run a marathon at mm, a sprint pace yes. I didn't have the energy at that point and that's when the climax of the thesis was really coming together that's when you need a bit more yes. reserve but I felt like my reserve was being really challenged yeah. and I was so, certainly very conscious of that with you when you we were supervising yeah. that that I, I think I moved to you working in short bursts yes. I think that's how we handled Which it which was isn't brilliant it? so mm. I was like okay well let's let's list 10 mm. small tasks mm. and do them as you mm. see fit mm. but I mean also you know the stress of the paid working mm. environment how did you mm. manage the stress did it bleed into the thesis uh, it really did um, yeah. because I think by that point I'd realised through the thesis that life is not purely quantitative. Um, you impact the world around you and vice versa and it, it, there's a natural evolution. There's no right or wrong. There's no one clear truth. Um, and I think I was certainly having that revelation at work as well in terms of my challenged identity mm. and the identities that you adopt in various modes of life. Um, so some of the uh, more critical aspects of my clinical work I was able to understand and appreciate in a slightly, slightly deeper way and to also understand that when my clinical work challenged me as a person that that wasn't a bad thing and that there are supports out there to help you through that and that has given me a lot of desire to do some further research in the paramedic um, identity space uh, to Huge. help us um, move forward when our clinical work um, impacts us personally yeah. because we are people, we're people 
you know, not just doing things, but we, we're being, um, and it's, yeah, it's not just about the, the tasks that we do during our role. So it, I felt like my clinical work and my research were almost parallel journeys <laughs> of development. But the interesting thing is they then started to come together mm. and they added a lot of texture, and I'll use the word heart, added a lot of heart to the thesis at the end, and you're writing improved and added a lot of complexity and texture in those final three months. Mm. Very powerful. I hope you don't mind me sharing one no, story that I will do. <laughs> there, there's one, I, I'll just share it. Um, where you got your supervisor a little bit frightened was the day you came in, you'd done one of these incredibly long shifts and was near the end of the PhD. I don't think you'd come straight from the shift, but you hadn't had enough sleep. Probably not. And you'd, you'd collapsed basically at the end of a shift and you were yeah. watching television. And do you remember the story yeah. I'm about to tell? Yeah. And the television show had someone on the side of the road going mm. through a heart, I think it was a heart mm. issue, and you start to cry. You actually Uncontrollably. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, <laughs> ugly crying. Yes, and so I, I started to ugly cry in the office, but, but I think that's, you know, that I'm, ho I'm still horrified, I'm still upset when I mm. tell that story, because it shows how on edge you mm. were, but also mm. I think that added a lot of passion to the thesis, and you know, mm. the thesis will clearly be a book that will be publishing shortly, but the paramedic identity I think mm. it's a fantastic mm. project and I think your second book and if you hadn't had that paid work during mm. the process mm. it wouldn't have emerged. Mm. I agree, I really agree. Mm. So I know it was horrendous for you and certainly your supervisor was very frightened <laughs> of you and for you at different times but mm. we've already mentioned a little bit about families mm. and friends and both of you have a, a wonderful family. Mm -hmm. Uh, wonderful families and wonderful mm. friends. But what's interesting is the pair of you lived away from a lot of your mm. families and friends and partners during the thesis. Mm. So what is the role of families and friends in this, particularly if you're away from some of them? Sunny, do you want to start us off? Um, well, my family have been supportive in more ways than I can ever thank them. Um, they might have not fully understood what I was doing, but you know, my dad is an avid person of sending me things that he's been reading, books he recommends. So he's really helped me a lot in, you know, just finding, you know, things from a different discourse. So he's in England, I'm in Australia. But if we're talking about race or the representation of particular marginalized groups, particularly after Trump, Brexit, um, he's sending me stuff that I'm not privy to in Australia. So that's... He, he was amazing in that regard. Friends, I can't thank them enough. I mean, they've kept me sane. For weeks when I just went ghost, they would, you know, Facebook me, message me, asking me if I was still alive, if everything is going well. So you do need strong support systems in your corner mm. during, during a PhD because it is a long distance race and it is lonely. Mm. There's a movie by a similar title. Yes, but there is. <laughs> Loneliness is a long distance runner. runner. Yes, um, and you definitely need people who you can count on just to whinge, to help you through mm. your day, or just to give you a meal or veggies. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think trust matters a lot, mm. uh, to have that trusting environment around you. I didn't have a trusting environment around mm. me doing my PhD, but I had great mates, mm. not a great supervisor. Mm. And so to be able to actually rely on somebody mm. when you're down, I think is really important. Yes. So very well said. Mm. Fam, for you, this is crucial. Yeah, look, my family and friends and um, boyfriend have been so precious. Um, so my parents live about 45 minutes away, which is close enough to have a meal, but it still does take a good half a day out. So given the busyness of my schedule, I couldn't do that multiple times a week. But at any point, I knew that I could ring them and say, hey, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in the area, can I swing by, or are you home? Wouldn't ever have to ask, but no <laughs> point going there if no one's home. Um, and mum would always have meat and at least three veg. Um, Dad Who would knew open this a would bottle be of wine. And <laughs> this is going incredibly well. And yes. it was just this reliable source of um, community and nourishment and... And love. And love, yeah, absolutely. And I, I could be vulnerable with them and I feel like they couldn't fix the issues mm. that I had, but they were always willing to hear it. Um, and I think like many of my friends um, are not in the academic world so can't understand yeah. from first hand experience mm. what the challenges are um, and what the options are as you navigate through that so they can't fix anything mm. and that I think makes it really difficult for them um, but they would always just let me 
get totally and utterly obsessed and out of perspective <laughs> without judging me. And no I judgment. look back now and I think, oh my goodness, I was obsessed with this yes. thesis. I couldn't think about anything. Mm. I would dream about highlighting text. <laughs> and I'd wake up in the morning and I'd be like, I've been copying and editing all the night long. <laughs> This was my life for about three months and they didn't judge me. Um, they kept me real. And likewise, when I just kind of had to quarantine yes. two weeks at a time to just smash out, you yeah. know, a version or whatever, um, they let me do that. Yes. And I I could relax in the fact that they would be there for me at the end when I emerged and tried to be a real person again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I've, I've had a, a really fabulous group of people around me who have just let me be me without judging me or criticizing me because there's a finite work to be done and telling me just to stop and have a break actually doesn't help because you know then yes. that you've got to do more work at the yes. end. So. And they have been, your friends have been wonderful. Can I also say, I mean, you colour code your life within an inch of its existence. Really when Amy entered my life, she colour coded my life. She got me organised. I didn't organise meetings with Amy. Amy organised meetings and put them in my calendar, just so you know, and they'd be colour coded and we have all sorts of different coloured comments and yeah. you'd never get between you and that thesis. Let me just tell you, <laughs> unbelievable, fantastic. And now this is the interesting bit for our colleagues around the world who might be watching this. You two are really the first PhD students to go through of the age that you are that have had the social media mm -hmm. support. So you've both been on Facebook, we're friends on Facebook. I know people disagree that supervisors shouldn't be <laughs> friends on Facebook. We might want to talk about that. But tell me about social media mm -hmm. and finishing a PhD. Rather than taking you away from it, finishing a PhD quickly. What does it do for you, Sansta? Um, for me, social media was phenomenal because my data, a lot of it, quite, quite a lot of it depended on participants. And social media facilitated me disseminating questionnaires, or recruiting interview participants. So for me, it wasn't just an escapist tool. It's both work and play, but you need to be able to separate the two, uh, which takes a lot of discipline. It helps if most of your friends live in a different time zone to you. So <laughs> you can get things done whilst they're sleeping and when they're up, just before you go to bed, that's when you do the fun. <laughs> But it made a real difference. Also, we did communicate, you communicated with your yes. supervisors. It was much more immediate. So I think what, how I've thought about it in the meta sense is when we've had something quick mm -hmm. to do, we did a quick interchange yes. on Facebook just in case one of us was not on the email. Yes. And also Twitter is ideal for ac any academic who's, you know, if you have an idea, if you've done like a vlog, a podcast, you want the world to listen or people to contribute to that. It's a great platform to just, you know, see what other thinkers in the field are thinking. Maybe they might comment. They might even ask you to do a review. Um, it's, it's, it's that happened to her last week, by the way. Someone <laughs> found her on Twitter, found the podcast, and asked her to do a review. Well, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> oh, my God, you. So it's, it, depending on how you use it, social media is good. Mm -hmm. There's academia.edu. Um, that's amazing for just... it's. As Steve Reddit, my other supervisor, um, says, um, it's like Facebook but for academics. So if you have drafts that you're working on and you want other people to read, maybe give you feedback or people just to know what you're doing, it's a great outlet. Twitter has got many academics on there, tweeting things in real time, commenting on socio-political situations, which works well in cultural studies. Um, and so it use it to your advantage, definitely. Now, this is going to be interesting. I saw you swallow while she was speaking. Um, now, because, of course, Sunny is very out and about on all the different social media sites. <laughs> She's out there, as you might have worked out. Now, Amy has a very clear sense of privacy, <laughs> boundaries, and limitations. Is that fair enough? Yeah. But you've, yeah. Also, <laughs> but, you, but you've also used Facebook. But I would argue for completely different ways that Sunny is mm. used. Reflecting back on it now, what was the role of like a Facebook? in your PhD? Mm. Well, I mean, to be honest, I didn't capitalise on it mm. half as much. Mm. I'm not very au fait with Twitter. I do have an account, and I think I've tweeted three times, <laughs> ever. 
Um, so I'm starting to get my feelers out there a bit more. Uh, with Facebook, uh, quite early on, as I was struggling to figure out what the heck is a PhD mm. and how do I write one, I had a friend um, who was who, who was doing one, and so I emailed her and said help. Mm. And she said, well, "Why don't you join a writing group?" And that was called the Arts Shut Up and Write group through a different university mm. here in South Australia. And so they added me to their Facebook group, and so we would use that to arrange mm. times to meet. And it was a private group. But just knowing that they were meeting, whether or not I could get there, yeah. it was an encouragement to me working at home yes. or um, to, to just know that there were other people mm. doing a similar isolated yes. journey that, and therefore we weren't isolated. Beautiful. So that really encouraged me and I um, was part of that for a good couple of years. Um, but I think because, as I mentioned before, so few of my friends and, and contacts are academics, um, I didn't feel yes. too comfortable posting so much about my, you know, my progress or whatever. So when I hit the hundred thousand word mark, I absolutely <laughs> put up a post about that because yes. I needed to celebrate that somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly when I finished the thesis, I, I wrote a little thing there, um, and was so surprised to see how many um, the, the responses that I got to that. I think it was a hundred and seven comments, mm -hmm. wasn't it, Amy? Wow. Yeah, and just to know that my contacts were so willing to join with me in that celebration was fabulous because I I was really trying to not be to not alienate my friends by mm. implying that my work was so much more important you know like it, but to allow them to celebrate with me and that was just lovely so I think that was probably born from a confidence issue that you sort of touched on yes. before that I don't want to pretend like mm. I'm the best thing just because I'm doing a PhD um, but it's such hard work. It we is. need to be willing to celebrate that and it to is. see that other people are willing to do that too was just so lovely and encouraging. And can I also offer a meta point just as someone who's watched you and watched how you've engaged with your wonderful family and friends. And when the thesis got a bit grunty, when you're working incredibly hard mm -hmm. and the thesis work was incredibly mm -hmm. hard near the end, you really did use it to keep in contact with your friends as mm. you, you as you really bunkered down for sort of mm. twenty hour days. Mm. It was almost like that was your social. It wasn't just social media. That was your social yes. connection mm, yeah. for the final couple of months. Mm. Is that how it was? It was, yeah, because I wasn't physically getting out. Mm. Um, so there were a good few weeks yes. there where I just wasn't physically seeing. You people. didn't get changed. You stayed in your pajamas for a couple I of those days. I worked in my pajamas and my boots. Hair everywhere. Coffee there. <laughs> it was. If anyone had knocked on the door, yeah. they would have got a fright. Which my next door neighbour did a couple of times. I think he thought, well, who is this woman? Um, but it was just mm -hmm. efficiency of time. Get up, put yes. the laptop up, start writing, yes. get some breakfast at lunchtime, and that's just, that mm. worked for me. <laughs> but therefore Facebook was the, was the way out yeah, while you're actually yes. the isolated. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All very, very useful. And last question, how great has this been? This is really <laughs> Amazing. Last question for the people, and we have a lot of them at Flinders and around the world. Hi, everyone, who have just started their PhD or maybe are midway and thinking, I want to get this through quickly. The longer you know, the longer a PhD goes, the less likely you are to finish. Mm -hmm. Full stop. So, what advice would you offer to people that are maybe starting the journey or going, what can I learn here? Sunny, off you go. I think the most valuable piece of advice I got when studying my PhD was work backwards. So have your finished date firmly there and work backwards to what research projects you're trying to do, what data you're trying to write up, or you know what free time you might need in between that. That way you are accountable for what you're doing and what you're not doing and you can self-regulate yourself. Mm -hmm. um, because often people, I've, I've had office mates, colleagues, say, oh, I'll just write, take three months to write it, and then six months tends to six, tends to nine, tends to a year, and you're not holding yourself accountable to those deadlines. So that helped me finish on time, um, just knowing that this was my cutoff date, and I was going to do the hardest I could to stick to that. Of course, life happens. Um, there are things we can't avoid, but don't work thinking you've got an extra six months in the bank or an extra year in the bank because things do change quite quickly mm. as well. And I mean, you went through incredible things. You've changed supervisors, changed universities, uh, as you've said, changed topics, you've changed states, 
you're an international student, so you change jobs as well. Mm -hmm. So what you just described there is, as you know, andragogically, that's called backward mapping. Mm -hmm. So this is what we need yes. to do, and backwardly map the progress. Mm -hmm. And she beat her own deadline <laughs> by two weeks. <laughs> Look at the bags, though. <laughs> oh, the glamour. The Chanel bags. The Ch <laughs> wow. Um, how do we beat that, Queen Amy? Um, what, but again, what would you say, because your journey's been distinctive, I think, from Sunny's, and mm. it's been distinctive and careful and considered and organised. It's been colour-coded. Yeah. It's been flagged. Uh, With check boxes to tick off along the way. She's, she's organised me within an inch of my life, can I say. Um, Amy, what, what would you say to everybody out there who are looking at you going, I want to be you, and I, I want to be you. Run fast, run No, I want to be you. What, what advice would you give? Because you've done it magnificently. Well, I would echo what Sunny said. So being organised, I think, is key and planning when you want to finish. I had to plan to finish three months before when I actually really wanted mm. to finish because I... I spent quite a bit of time unwell or, you know, think life yes, happens like yes, that and I had to build that into my plan. Um, so I was quite structured with what I could do mm -hmm. each day, knowing that if I, if I limited that, it was achievable. Mm -hmm. And if I got one day behind, I could make yes. it up. Yes. But also exercising the sort of discipline that I heard someone say, don't trust your tomorrow self or something mm -hmm. like that. So rather than say, oh, I don't really feel like it today, I'll do it all tomorrow. Don't trust yourself mm. tomorrow. Just do today's work today. Yes. Because I know that when I get behind and have this mountain to catch up on, it's hard. Mm. So I had to build in time for me. But I knew that I could enjoy that time mm. more if I'd earned it by yes. working. So I could then have guilt-free relaxation, which encouraged me and spurred me on. Um, rather than just having a whole mm. day off, I would have half days and, mm. and work for a good four to six yes. hours in the morning, and that was actually really yes. a full work day yes. worth of productivity. Mm. So that was a key for me, um, and yeah, the, the scheduling, but also being flexible with myself um, to say, you know what, today is just actually not happening, mm. and to let myself just say, mm. I'm just going to write it off and start again tomorrow if I did it two days in a row that was not okay because yes. that was then starting to become mm -hmm. a habit but it took a long time well <laughs> <You're> so, <yeah. laughs> it took a long time to get to know myself enough to mm. do that so I would start yes. by binge writing and mm. then reading for days and then doing other stuff for weeks mm. and then come back to writing mm. and it was just unnecessarily tiring tiring mm. it was productive but it wasn't really sustainable, yes. so yeah. I had to figure out a more sustainable option. And now, on my days off, it's an okay thing to work for just an hour in the morning, yes. and it's still a day off, because yes. then you go out and think, oh, I've done so much, and it's not even seven in the morning, so. Right, I, I have learnt more in the last few minutes than I can ever tell you, don't trust your tomorrow self. Mm. Let me just say, when I uh, decided to come back to Australia, what would it have been about five years ago? Five years ago mm -hmm. now, I hoped we would meet interesting people. I hoped that we would do good work, we would contribute to the nation and maybe make a difference. Mm -hmm. I had no sense that I would meet wonderful, extraordinary women like are sitting at this table. These two women mm -hmm. really, I mean, this is what universities are about. This is what universities are for. So if anybody out there is going, oh, well, what's the point of a university? Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, the point of a university is sitting at this table. Mm -hmm. Universities can make a person in their present become their future self. Mm -hmm. And think about how these two great women are going to change this country. Thank you both for your advice. You remain, yes, unicorns, <laughs> but that means special, mythic, extraordinary, but also inspirational. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>